to our feet. It's good to see you this morning. We're here to worship the Lord together this morning. Let's sing it out. Just one word. Just one word, you come a storm that surrounds me. Just one word, the darkness has to be treated. Just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. Just one touch. Nothing that our God can't do. Just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Thank you, Lord. Just one word, you, you revive every dream. Just one touch. Please be seated. 
All right. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, that was really good. I'm not going to say good morning again. That sounded great. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. Welcome to the Heights. My name is Brandy Waters. I'm the discipleship coordinator. And we are in full swing of our family series this summer. It is called Heights Focus on Faith. So for the past six weeks, we've been focusing on faith and what that looks like in our day-to-day -day lives. The past two weeks, we've given you guys a family challenge, and several of you have participated in that. It was called Table Talk Challenge, and it was so simple. We just said, read a scripture, ask questions, and pray with your family. So we had a couple people participate in that in the past couple weeks, and I have a drawing for a Sweet Frog gift card. So Justin, come on up. He's going to draw. Justin, your family's in here, by the way, so we'll see, yeah. I think that's a conflict of interest. Oh, my goodness. Seriously, look at it. it. That can't happen. <laughs> All right, Schultz family, let's give him a hand. Uh, that's not fair. <laughs> Maddie's like, please, okay. Why do all the other ones have Schultz on them, too? <laughs> that's funny. No, y'all win, really, they did it. So good job, Schultz family. All right, yeah, give him a hand. Good job. <laughs> All right, and now we have our last challenge. So the last two weeks of our Focus on Faith series, we want you guys to put your faith in action. And so to tell us about what that will look like, here's Justin Schultz, our youth pastor. Well, we're really excited because this is going to be an opportunity for all of us to play. We, we love audience participation. Anybody that can go back to those teenage years, you used to spend the time, spend your, you know, free time at skating rinks. You remember when you went to the skating rink and it was an all skate? Well, this is an all skate because everybody gets to participate, okay? We want to collect 2,020 of these softballs to go in our uh, Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes that we're going to pack in November. The purpose of this, we had somebody on our staff who came up with a great idea to honor Miss Mia Stokes. And so what we want to do is we want to collect 2,020 softballs and we're going to hand them over to a team of people who are actually going to write scripture verses on the softballs then they're going to go in the shoe boxes, and then they're going to go somewhere around the world and bless a child. Sharing the gospel, which was Mia's God goal at the beginning of this year, to be more bold in sharing her faith and God with other people. And so we're going to honor her, and we're going to do this together as a church. So you can buy softballs online through Amazon and sporting goods stores. You can actually go to a store like Academy Sports and places like that where you can buy softballs. And we're just, we'll just ask, and, and, and I think you would probably agree with this, that we don't receive the softballs that have the threads coming apart and they've been hit so many times and, you know, maybe they got hit by a lawnmower and it's like that's not usable anymore, so we'll give it to the church. We're going to ask that you not give us those because we want to do our best, both for the kids that will receive them and in Miss Mia's honor. So if you will help us the next two weeks collect 2,020 softballs, we're going to do this to the glory of the Lord and in honor of Miss Mia. So thank you very much. I hope you're blessed today. as we continue to worship. Still, the rage in me to still 
control what 
Just the voices. So here I time. So here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together Full to me, you're all together wonderful to me, you're all together wonderful to me, you're all together. Jesus, you're wonderful. In this place this morning, we just pause. And God, we forget about all the distractions that are going on in this world. And God, we focus on you. The God who makes the darkness tremble. The God that we're here to worship this morning. Jesus, we thank you so much what you did on that cross when you died for our sins. God, we praise you in this place. Jesus, we thank you so much for just the spirit that we feel right now. Your presence is here. Not for a minute are we forsaken because you are in this place. So God, right now in the stillness of this moment, we just, we just praise you. We say thank you. Just thank him in your own way. If that means raising your hands, if that means just praying to yourself, just thank him in your own way right now. thank him the God that's all together wonderful to you make it personal thank you so much for being our personal savior thank you so much for being our friend that's closer than a brother 
We lift you high, Jesus. We ask you that you would just continue to move in this service today. We give you praise, honor, and glory for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Praise God for uh, the blessing he's given us of having a great worship team. Uh, I'm just telling you, it's awesome. Awesome. Really is a blessing. I'm, I'm thankful for all them who are faithful to, pro to keep on working together. I'm thankful that uh, Clint has come our way. Adam Levine was on the drums today. We're thankful he stopped by and uh, played with us, and uh, we're, we're very happy with that. And uh, so... No, it's Chris. Some of you are looking at me like, you on something this morning, preacher? <laughs> I'm on Jesus is all I can tell you. That's, that's it. Uh, I do appreciate you coming. Uh, I want us to go back to the Lord one more time in prayer. And the reason for it is um, all of you know uh, Bobby Lambert and her family, uh, the Thomas family. Uh, Bill Thomas, the dad, has been diagnosed with stomach cancer. It's fast growing. They only give him two weeks. And he's been put into a hospice unit in Kings Mountain. That family is trying their best to hang in there. So I want us to believe God for Bill. Bill is uh, ready to meet Jesus. He, he said that. He's actually looking forward to it. But you know how it is. Nobody, who's, who wants anybody to go that route, right? And uh, so I don't want to rob him of a great blessing of seeing Jesus face to face. But at the same time, I'm willing to see if God's will will go there because I know how God can heal, right? So join me in prayer as we pray for Bill. Father, in Christ's name, I thank you and praise you, even as I have said to my brother and sister here, thank you for those who play and, and sing for your glory and lead us into your very presence because you are here. And your presence is here in every way. And I pray that our eyes, our very, the soul that's within us would be aware that we're in the presence of a holy God. And I pray that, God, everything that is said and done in this place will point people to you. We do pray for Bobby and the Thomas family. For, but right now I'm asking for healing for Bill. And I know you can heal him in heaven. I know that's wholeness, whole, never to be sick, no more pain. That's, that's what that can be. But I'm asking God in Christ's name if, if your mercy is involved in that and and this is a, a, a time that we can show how great you are, as Jesus said. Uh, I'm praying that you would heal Bill, that you would remove the cancer from him. Like old Shaky did years ago, he would walk out of hospice. And I pray, dear God, that you would get all the glory and honor. And I'm not exercising a lack of faith, God, but we want your will done more than anything. And so if your will is that he come on to be with you, then, God, you be with that whole family. Surround them with your love. We pray, God, that we'll be aware that you are God and you do heal and you do save, you do forgive, and we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. And we thank you for it. We are in this series, uh, Focus on Faith, and I think it's very appropriate because, I don't know, the last nine or ten months, it's been a crazy world, and there's a lot in this church who have had family members who have died. Some have uh, got family members who are dying. Some have had family members who have been in a hospital and they couldn't be with them. Some have family that are in nursing facilities, and they can't even get in there to see them except by looking through the window, and now I think they've stopped that. We've heard things such as uh, uh, all about COVID, and then it was uh, what was a murder hornets and, um, you know, killer worms. I mean, it was just, it was something every day that was going to get us. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, now the news is all saying it's mutated. It's mutated. I hadn't really heard that from a viable source, but we get that kind of thing all the day. 
And uh, you wonder in a world when you start hearing your favorite eating places going out of business, you're going, hey, come, I like that place, you know. And we love those kind of things, but in reality, you start wondering when all of a sudden you go in and they say, no cash. Huh? <laughs> no cash. Somebody's hoarding pennies now. I, I don't... I don't know. I, I guess they've got just found out they got all the toilet paper in the world, so they're going to hoard pennies now. I don't, I don't know exactly what it is, but there's a lot of things. And I, I'll be honest with you, I get bombarded on a regular occasion with people who have reached the end of their rope. I mean, even kids are getting to the point right now where they're just depressed, anxious. I mean, it's crazy how kids are being affected by this. Uh, and some of them do it in different ways. And, and I'm seeing the whole uh, range of people at different ages who are battling different things in their life. And so I thought it was kind of appropriate today that the passage of Scripture in this focus on faith is from Acts 27, the first chapter, through the 10th verse of chapter 28. I'm not going to read that whole passage. I'm going to read some as we go through but that old passage is about the man called Paul who at one time persecuted and killed and, and tried his best to lock up as many people as he could who were Christians, <clears throat> met, re met the resurrected Jesus, and in meeting the resurrection of Jesus was completely transformed. He became one of the greatest followers of Jesus Christ that has ever lived. And he suffered the same kind of persecution, the same kind of attempts on his life that the one he followed did. He's been arrested. He's on his way to see uh, Caesar in Rome. And uh, they put him on a ship with other prisoners. And he knows that's the end of his life. That's going to be the end of his life. But he knows that God has a purpose in his life and so he's willing to cover it out. And this is the story of all the difficulties and things that went on in his life just from the time he was handed over to the, the shipmaster to get to Italy. And uh, I think it's very, very appropriate for us to be able to look at that because there's a couple things right out of the shoot. Number one, if you're a believer in Christ, you've got to know that you have a purpose. You're here for a reason. I would say to you that don't know Jesus, you have a purpose. You're not here by mistake. Nobody is here by mistake. Nobody here is an accident. There's accidental parents, but there's no accidental people. We're here because God has a plan and a purpose and a design for our lives. When you realize that and you begin to live out of that, doesn't mean your whole life's going to be, oh, it's going to be so great. It's just going to be... Never, no hardships and, and no sickness. No, I mean, we're not in heaven, we're on earth. And evil and wicked people with evil hearts do evil things. And so we experience a lot of stuff. The purpose of God, you've got to know. And, and, and seek it out in your life with all your heart and with all your soul. And in times like we've gone through, and some of you have been through times like myself that were as bad, may not have been bad as bad globally, but it is as bad in many other ways. I want us to look at his scripture and learn some lessons. I want to begin to, by reading the first four verses of Acts 27. And there the word of God says, And when it was decided that we should sail for Italy, they delivered Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. And embarking in a ship of Adramatium, and I don't have a clue whether I pronounced that right, okay, which was about to sail to the ports along the coast of Asia, we put to sea, accompanied by Aristarchus and a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him leave to go to his friends and be cared for. And putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. So he's doing what God's asked him to do, and the journey starts out after getting around with his friends, and he's having this time together. It's a great time. All of a sudden, the winds were against them. 
And I want to say here first that faith is, when you're talking about faith, faith is trusting God when the winds of life are against us. Faith is trusting God when the winds of life are against us. Now, I love gentle breezes in the morning. That, to me, there ain't nothing like it. Even in the summertime, if I can just sit outside a minute with a cup of coffee and there's a gentle breeze blowing, oh, my land. I could just sit there all day if I could just have that, you know. Uh, I, I like watching the leaves in the trees dancing to the music of the wind. It's an amazing thing. They're turning and everything else, and the birds are going on. It's really great. But I'm not fond of strong winds, blowing winds that are disruptive and hard to concentrate and hard to move forward. A couple of weeks ago, my family and I were at Fripp Island down in South Carolina, and we were, on the, we were headed to the beach. And Janet and I were bringing up the tail end of the whole family who had all gone ahead of us. And we got there to, it was a long, about a, a, a probably 50 yards of deep sand out there. When I got to the end of that thing, the wind was blowing so strong that I had to, I had to walk like this to try to get into it. It kept blowing my hat off. I don't wear my hat backwards much, but I had to turn it around, you know, because it kept blowing it off. And I thought, man, and all of a sudden, we just, we got down there, and I was determined I was going to get an umbrella up for Janet. That was the craziest thing in the world. A couple times, as big as I am, I thought it was going to take me up. I, just, I really did. I thought, well, this would be crazy. I, I wouldn't be in Kansas anymore, right? Right up. But I finally got that thing twisted in the ground <laughs> where we just about had to lay under it. You know what I'm saying? But the wind kept blowing that thing, and I had to sit there in a chair with my hand on that thing the whole time, that thing like this, just like this, <laughs> so she could get some shade, you know what I'm saying? And, uh, and, and the whole time I'm doing that, the sand is coming up and stinging me like a thousand bees. You ever been hit by the sand at the beach? I'm just going to tell you, it ain't fun. It ain't fun. And I grit in my teeth. I was just like, good grief. I, I took that umbrella down. I put it over and said, if we're going to stay here, you'll just have to. Get. She said, there is no sun. I said, well, why did I put it up? You know, and it just led to some other things. You know, it wasn't just the wind. It was just bad all around. I really didn't like that. And I was ready to go back to the house, to be honest with you. And I, I sat there for just a few minutes. And I realized, I, I, as I began to think about it, just how parallel Everything that I was experiencing right there are just like the winds of life that I've had to wrestle with in my life and others have to wrestle with themselves. That life is not always a gentle breeze or leaves dancing in the trees to the music of the wind. Sometimes it's blowing hard and it's stinging and it tends to want to take you off course and it's easier to turn around and go in the opposite direction so the wind's blowing you rather than blowing against you. But some started out in my life, and I know it's been yours, I've had some gentle breezes. I really have. But it seems out of nowhere they gained force over time. A gentle breeze soon began to blow a little stronger and then a little stronger. And some came out of nowhere and would catch me off guard and, and, and uh, leaving me, uh, 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 if I had any control, just a little bit of control. Tended wanting to blow me over this way or blow me over that way and the more difficult winds that came slowed me down my pace wasn't going as fast as i wanted it to go in life i had plans i had places i was going things i needed to do but now i'm i'm like there's all kinds of things that are like strong winds that are blowing aside and some of them kept me from going and making me deep down inside thinking maybe i just need to quit Winds that come from inside of us, winds of fear. Winds of fear. There's a lot of fear in the world right now. There's a lot of fear. And I understand that because it's so the unknown. But when those winds blow in there, they tend to make you uneasy and it's hard to take another step. And sometimes it just seems it's better to turn around and go the opposite direction. And sometimes there's winds of sadness, and grief. We just blow all the time, and it seems we never have a day without it in our life. And there's winds of uncertainty. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to, what, what's going to take place? How's this going to affect my kids in school? And what's going to happen over here if my job 
uh, shuts down, where it's the winds of self-doubt. I don't know, can I really do this? Do I have the ability to do this? Am I, is God really loving me and kind? I mean, we all encounter those difficult winds throughout our life when we're tempted to seek safety. And sometimes the sad part is, it's to go back to some things we knew were destructive, but at least we knew what they were like, and we call it security. Sometimes we want to go back there. Sometimes we keep on struggling, and it's just every day until we finally run out of strength and give in and let those difficult winds blow us wherever it wants to blow us. But when you decide to walk through the winds of your life, when you decide that Jesus Christ is real, that he is in you, and that he does love you, that he has a purpose for you, that he cares for you, and you take hold of his hand and walk with him hand in hand, you begin, even in the midst of storm, this experience, these times of stillness, times of peace, times of strength and resolve and courage, no matter how strong the winds come. And that takes faith in God through Christ because we can endure for a while, but after a while, we can't. We give it, it's too tiring, it's too much. It's just easier to toss it all in. Faith and understanding that sometimes the difficult winds in your life can help you is a plus as well. You see, we, when I talk about difficult winds, when I began to talk about them in, uh, down on that beach, I was thinking about them. I thought about everything I've just told you, all the things that happened. But then all of a sudden it occurred to me that sometimes winds help us, strong, difficult winds help us. For one thing, they can make you aware of how weak you are and how much you need to keep trusting in that which you can't see, Amen. which is exactly what we're talking about bottom line. You see, they can stir up the sand that may sting us, but that sand is sanding off the rough parts of your character that started to surf, surface in your life, and he's smoothing you out. It's part of the Holy Spirit allowing those winds to come as he makes us more and more like Jesus. And they're also required to build up your faith and my faith and our endurance transforming us into a mature follower of Jesus. You see, there's too many of us that just come to know Jesus, and we get baptized, and we go to church, and we expect everybody hunky-dory, but we never go anywhere. We never mature. We never get to that point, and when things do blow hard, we tend to want to leave. But I want you to remember here like that we can trust God. Jesus tells us about this process. And what happens to us when we stay walking in him, trust in him. Ephesians 4, verse 14 and 15, he says this, then we will no longer be infants. Now look at this, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. You see, when we walk with Jesus and we begin to trust him, even when we don't understand, we trust him that he has us and we're seeking him and trying to fulfill our purpose, then, then we won't be blown about by every wind that comes. We won't be deceived in ourselves. We won't come to that point of giving up. Like Paul, we need to keep trusting, staying strong and persevering no matter how you feel. And this is how a good example he really set there in that passage. We, we can't allow the difficult winds in our marriage, the difficult winds in our parenting, or our difficult winds of self-value where we don't think we can amount to much or we've blown it or we're too old or too young. We don't want to let those winds blow open our life to allow our enemy, the destroyer, to set up a beachhead in our life to get a foothold in our mind, to get a, a place in our heart or our spirit because he will destroy us. That's what he'll do. We've got to hold on to the truth that we are the beloved children of God 
who he loved enough to give his only son for, and that Jesus is holding your hand and my hand, and he will give us everything we need to cross the finish line and therefore be courageous and determined to stay on God's path of eternal life no matter what happens. Because faith is hanging on to God in Christ no matter what comes. And remember this verse, Hebrews 13, verse 5, the second half of that verse through verse 6, and this is what it says. For God has said, I will never leave you. I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. Let us be bold then and say, the Lord is my helper. I, am not, I will not be afraid. What can anyone, what can any wind do to me? So, so faith is trusting God when the winds of life are blowing against us. But secondly, in this passage in Acts 27 through 28, I see that faith is also trusting God when violent storms threaten to sink us. It's different than winds. Look at verse, uh, verses 13 and 15 of Acts 27. He says this, Now when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous wind called the, nor called the nor'easter struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven alone. In verse 18, since we were violently storm-tossed, they began the next day to jettison the cargo. Now, I, want to veer, I don't know how yours calls that wind up there in verse 14. My, my translation of that is the English Standard Version. It says tempestuous wind, but that tempestuous wind, no matter how you may have translated it in your Bible, is coming from the same Greek word. And if I said it, if I said that Greek word as it looks like it is in English, I would say typhoon. Anybody ever heard of typhoon? You know, a typhoon is a hurricane. We call them hurricanes on the east. They call them most of the time typhoons on over in the west. But the reality is it is a hurricane force wind. We're not talking about a strong wind blowing sand in your face. We're talking about a wind of great violence. And when we're in the midst of not just strong winds, but hurricane force winds, that threaten to destroy our lives, our families, and drown us in its wake, sink us beneath its raging waters. It is paralyzing, causing our emotions to go all over the place. And, and, and I don't know, has anybody been there with me? I mean, you just go all over the place. You don't know which way to go because it, is, it looks like it's going to destroy you. It looks like you're not going to survive. We feel overwhelmed. We feel stressed to the max, stretched to the limit, fearful. And you know what? We're ready to dump everything in our life and just run. We're ready to dump and just run. Run as far away as possible and keep on running and keep on dumping. And I'm talking to people right now that that's been the pattern of your life forever. You keep running and dumping. Something doesn't go well and it looks like the winds are starting to pick up and it's now starting to swirl around. You run and dump. And now you've been running and dumping and you're in the same place you were the first time you ever ran and dumped. You've not made any progress. That's how, it, this is what this hurricane does. You know, you come up, you, these violent storms, it's terrible to be in. You know, it's, what do you do? You don't have enough time, but there's too much to do. And you're running around, you're looking how am I going to get all this done? I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money, we say, uh, in there. I don't have enough energy. I'm wore out. I can't do any more, we say. Nothing seems to be working out for our good. Why does everything happen good to everybody else and not to me? Why is it I work? Why is it I do? Why is it I do this? And instead, everything is on it, and it seems that your ship is sinking. Your ship is sinking fast, and panic begins to rise, and you wonder, does God even care? 
I mean, if God's so loving, why is destruction blowing all around me? The roof is coming off my family. My marriage is going down quick. My kids don't give a rip about nothing. They're out of control. I mean, we're doing it. You know, it, it's there. It's, it's, the, it's a terrible place to be. The disciples in the New Gospels, they know what that was like. You know the story, Matthew 8, 23 through 25. He told the disciples to, we were going to the other side, and it says they got in a boat, him and his disciples, and the next thing they knew, they were in a severe storm. And the Bible says that waves were crashing into the boat, crashing into the boat. Where's Jesus? Asleep. Now, that's the first cue right there, right? Jesus is asleep. Waves are crashing. Some of you are in a, tur a turmoil right now, and you're going, whoa, 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 whoa what are we going to do? What's happening here? How, my ship's sinking. We, we've got to start throwing things overboard. We've got to, I've got to get rid of this husband. I've got to get rid of this wife. I, I'm going to have to do this with my kids. Kids are saying, I'm going to run away. I'm going to do my own thing. And we're doing all this stuff. We're ready to go. I, I've got to quit my job. I've got to give up. We can't go on. We've got this panic. And we're going, where's God? Now I say to you, he is where he always is in the peace and calm of being sovereign God in control of every aspect of your life and mine. He's not up in heaven running around trying to spin plates going, oh, I didn't know that was going to happen. I didn't know that was going to happen. Let me see if I can work this. No, God is in control. And you and I are going to the other side no matter how much hell the devil brings on us. If you know Jesus. And then it says they roused him up saying, Master, save us. We're going down. Sometimes that's all you can pray. Somebody asked me, said, Pastor, how long do you pray? I said, sometimes I don't pray more than about 20 seconds. What? Yeah, because my prayer a lot of times and has been here lately, help. That's all I can say is help me. <coughs> and you know what? He's helped me. Uh, I, me and Janet experienced this past week. I, I was telling her about something, how God just came through in a way we couldn't believe. And she was just smiling from ear to ear. And I told her, I said, you know, what, you know how long I prayed this morning about this? She said, how long? I said, about 15 seconds. She said, is that supposed to impress me? No. I just wanted you to know. I prayed 15 seconds. That's how powerful that prayer was. <laughs> yeah. That went nowhere, by the way. But I told her, I said, let me tell you what I prayed though for 15 seconds. Help, 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 help. No joke. That's all I said. Why? I didn't know what to pray. I just knew this. I needed God to intervene, and he did. And that's our prayer. It's there. Some of you that are watching by live stream, some of you that are here in, in this auditorium are in a hurricane right now. Oh, you look calm. You're, you make it appear you're in the eye. Everything's peace and calm. But inside, it's like a hurricane you know that's raging. Uh, a death has left you down for the count. Your finances have turned into a financial typhoon, and it's just a matter of time. A physical tornado may be threatening your life or a family member, and it's bad enough. It's so bad in your life that you're even despairing of life. Suicide's gone off the top during COVID. I'm just telling you, it's not, it's not, it's not just young people, it's all ages. You're so bad, we just say, I can't, I can't do this any longer. Some of you are in a relational or a marriage hurricane, and you know your ship's sinking. You're ready to dump everything and run it, and you've been running. Let me say, here is a word of God for you this morning. Stop it. Stop running and dumping. Trust the Lord. Faith is trusting the Lord when the violent storms come. Listen to what Matthew said to his disciples. Why are you afraid? You see, I think that's a great question. He, he knows they're human. He knows you and I are human. We're going to have fear. But here's the thing. He's in the boat with them. You understand what I'm saying? You're, if you know Jesus, you're not going through what you're going through alone. Stop acting like it. He is in the boat, and he says, why are you afraid? And then listen, you don't have enough faith. 
You don't trust me enough to know that I know what I'm doing and I can take even the greatest mess a hurricane leaves, leaves in your life and turn it into something that will not only be beneficial for you, but give me glory. He wants us. That's what he's saying. And he says, that then he got up and he gave a command to the winds and the waves and they became constantly calm. And they all were shocked and said, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the waves obey. Folks, that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Or listen to John 16, 33. Jesus said, I've told you all this so that you may be, have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I, Jesus, have overcome the world. He is greater than all our problems, all our sorrows. That is why we can count on him. He's in the boat with you. And so if you're in that hurricane, listen, Jesus is with you. If you've trusted him, he's with you. If you're in a hurricane, you say, that's me, but I don't know that I know Jesus. Why not? He is available. He says, trust me and I'll save you. Call upon my name and you will be saved. The scripture says it's there. But look down in verse 20. In Acts 27, 20, Paul, Luke writing here says, When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Let me tell you something. Faith is trusting God when dar the darkness around us is so dark we lose all hope. And that's a, that's a terrible place to be where there is no hope. There's no hope. Do you ever lose your way? Do you ever feel like you're in such darkness that you don't have any, uh, any, any idea which way to go? I mean, when you look at your past, you see nothing but disappointments. And when you look at your present, you see nothing but confusion. What's going on? What, what's happening? Which way do I go? When you look at your future, you're doubtful and worried. Do I even have a future? I mean, if it keeps going this way, is there a future? And some of you get to the point where you feel like there's no light in your life at all. That you're just in the darkness and it's a bad, terrible place. You see things in the darkness. You hear things in the darkness. I wish my grandma, five foot tall, to come in here today from heaven and just say, let me tell you about this big preacher here when he was a kid and all the lights went out. I mean, I heard things, I saw things, and the more I, 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 the more I saw, the bigger they got. I mean, I had monsters walking around, and, and I, would take, I would take squeaky toys and place them all through the house so that if anybody walked through the house and they stepped on that, and I can still hear my grandpa fussing at me because he'd go, e -e 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 Junior! <laughs> Scared to death. Because in the dark, that's what you tend to do. Things get bigger in the dark. You ever notice that? She'd close the door and she'd have a, a, one of her uh, little sweaters hanging on the back of that thing. We'd have the closets in there. And it'd be dark and I'd look over at it and before long, it looked like it was about a seven foot giant over there hanging out at behind the door. And I'd be going, Grandma! She'd come in there and say, what is it, son? I said, I can't see. And they didn't have a light switch. And so she'd have to climb up on the bed and pull the little cord on the cord hanging out of the wall, out of the ceiling. And she'd say, son, it's nothing but my sweater. It was amazing in the light how little that thing was and how non-threatening it was. But the dark tends to make us want to give up and, and to quit in our life. But listen. The reason is because we allow the darkness. If you're a believer, in order for you to be in darkness, you have to allow the darkness to take over your life. This is what Jesus said in John 20, 35. The one who walks in the dark doesn't know where he's going. See, so you, can't, you can't see where you're going. You know, it's, it's crazy when some guys let, let me out in Alabama and said, look, I know you hadn't been hunting on this piece of property, but 
you just you go down here about so far and then turn to the right and if you keep looking up when it starts to get a little light you'll see you shooting shooting tower i said okay so i got out you know i'm walking down through there and i thought i was doing good i thought i was doing real good and so it's dark i just keep walking through there and i thought man i don't see no shooting tower i couldn't see nothing it's just crazy kind of thing and all of a sudden you know i, I was hearing things and all this and I got right there, and, and suddenly I looked up, and I did see it. I said, okay, right there. And so I went up. When the, when the sun came up and I'm in the shooting tower, I realized that had I taken one more step, I'd have went down in a 20-foot-deep pond. That where I stepped right there, I couldn't even see the water. It was so dark. If I took one more step, I'd be, see, you don't know where you're going, Right? It's in the light, though, I knew, oh, boy, look where I about went to, you know. And, and so it is. In the darkness, your pain, your confusion, your hurt, it seems like nobody cares. Nobody cares. You've tried and tried, but you keep turning up in the same darkness as you start to lose hope. And the enemy, our, who is the devil, is a thief. He is a liar. And he wants more than anything in the world to steal your hope. That's the reason he wants you in the darkness. Corinthians says that for those that are lost, that don't know Jesus, the devil blinds their eyes. That doesn't mean he can make them see. He just is like this. You see, but you don't see. Why? Because he can steal your life when you lose hope. You lose hope in the darkness. All hope of being saved was at last abandoned, was the words. But listen to what Jesus said in John 8, 12. I am the light of the world. So if you follow me, you won't be stumbling through darkness, for living light will flood your path. We walk in him. He will show us. On what are the bases are you making your uh, decisions in the dark times, those major decisions. Uh, well, I thought it was, a, I, I thought or I felt like it was the right thing to do. Have you not learned yet that feelings are highly unreliable to be able to make any decision in life? I mean, you might have woke up, slept wrong, woke up in a bad mood and make a terrible decision. You got a whole, might have got a hold of some bad food during the night. You just suffer the after effects of indigestion. You just, Feelings are unreliable in every sense of the word. It's not a good way to make decisions based on feelings. Well, everybody else is doing it. Oh, my gosh. Mama was right, you know. Mama, I want to grow my hair out to my shoulders. And she said, you're not going to do it. I'm going to give you buzz cut on that thing. I said, I want my hair to grow down to my shoulders because Larry's doing it and so-and-so's doing it and so-and-so's doing it. She said, I don't care if the whole world's doing it. You're not doing it. I later learned that's pretty how Jesus said, just because everybody else is doing something don't make it right, don't make it good, and doesn't mean you ought to make that decision. Because why? The majority can often be wrong. Well, it's gotten me through. What I'm doing now has gotten me through before. It may not be the best thing, but I'm going to keep on doing it. After it's wrecked your life, after it's proved over and over, it doesn't help you a bit. It just puts you further behind. Stop believing your own lies. When you face doubt, doubt, there's a reliable source that you know will always give you the right advice and never lead you wrong, and it's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. If you get in the Word, read the Word. I, I've read through Psalms so many times I can't even keep up with it. I really can't because it's my life. Ever since I got saved, somebody told me, read through the Psalms every day. Read five Psalms every day, one proverb. Every month you'll read through the Psalms. I've been doing it forever. But the other day I came in and in the office, I was sitting in the office and my heart was just burdened for people. And, and I just started in Psalm 1. I read, I read over to probably Psalm 80, 85, somewhere around in there, and, and making notes that I went. It was just amazing to me to be able to look in to God's Word. And sure enough, that Word was what Psalm 119, 105 is, is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. And it was reading those Psalms, I saw all the emotions that I see some of you have. And I saw how some people were just so angry with God, but by the time they got to the end, they were praising God because they knew he was reliable. 
It is the only reliable guide along with the spirit leading you from stumbling, keep you from stumbling, to help you see things clearly, stop believing the lies. And if you're in Christ, if he is first in your life, you ask the Holy Spirit to guide you on paths financially and physically and relationally as he shows us in the word, his own word. And you begin to overcome the darkness. That's a promise. But then look at verse 25 and 26 of Acts 27. It says, so take heart, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I've been told. But we must run aground on some island. These men were wanting to get out. Paul said, God then showed me, you better stay where you're at. Paul had great faith here. And so faith is trusting God and being obedient to him in the interruptions of life. This is a big interruption. This thing had got up and it was getting so bad, they decided, some of the guys said, I'm getting out of this. I ain't going to participate in this. But I think we need to. Let me, let me share with you some words of a man who helped me a lot, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He said this, we must be ready to allow ourselves to be interrupted by God. God will be constantly crossing our paths and canceling our plans, sending us people with claims and petitions it is a strange fact that Christians and even ministers frequently consider their work so important and urgent they will allow nothing to disturb them. They think they're doing God a service in this, but actually they're disdaining God. Crooked yet straight path. Interruptions will sometimes come from God. It was just there. Uh, it, it, it is the power of allowing God to know that it's not something that God is stopping. It's not always a no. Sometimes he interrupts us and makes us get in time with him and spend time with him and, and discern what his will is rather than our own selfish ambition. You see, some of us are so busy with our own plan, our own ambition, and when it gets, something happens, whether it's strong winds or hurricane or whatever it may be, these interruptions that come and rather than allow God to run us aground in a retreat where we have nothing to do but to be with him, to pray and to seek his word, we begin to think, man, I'm telling you, I can't win. I, I need this. You know, I don't need this right now. I've got this to do. God reserves for him his right to, to break into our lives without question or explanation. It could be a shattering phone call. It could be a disturbing letter. It, 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 those may be the first steps of God's interruption in our life. But God does the initiating oftentimes because he needs our attention. So exercise your faith is what I'm saying. Exercise your faith. You, some of you are in here, you're being interrupted. You were doing well, but something's kicked you back. Maybe it's a choice you've made or whatever. Listen to me. Keep following Jesus. It's the old bicycle. You fell off the bicycle. You wrecked. Get back up. Get on that bicycle and start riding. It, obey his commands in, in the midst of the interruptions of, to your plans and your agendas. And if you look down in verse 34 through 38, you know, <laughs> get this. They're sinking. They're in a storm. It's a terrible thing. And you know what Paul says? Guys, I think we need to eat supper. You won't eat supper and we're going down. We didn't throw, we were throwing everything overboard. Life is about to beat us down and you're saying eat supper. You remember when there's a man named Elijah that was running away from God, trying to run away from God and run away from Jezebel because he felt like that his life was over and he's laying under a broom tree saying, kill me, God, I want to die. But he's woken up by an angel. Remember what the angel had done? Baked him a cake of bread, right? He said, get up and eat. The journey, you, you need strength for the journey. Listen, folks, that one of the things you can do is in the physical side, take care of yourself physically. Don't let these interruptions in your life keep you from doing what you know to keep yourself as physically healthy as you can because as your health goes, so does your mind. It really does. But then if you'll notice here as well, there was a spiritual aspect because he began to pray and to thank God for that bread. Acts 27, 32 through 36. He took that bread, he prayed for it, he broke it just like Jesus did with the disciples. 
He gave them bread to eat. We know if you go back and read at the beginning of this chapter of 27, you will understand that he took prayer seriously because even an angel gave him a vision of what he was going to do and how he was going to stand before the Caesar the, the, in, in Rome. So you must begin to thank God and to praise God even if hell is all around you, you thank God, praise God. He inhabits the praise of his people. Do not let the enemy knock, your, knock you out. Listen, knock you down, yes, but not knock you out. Right? Because we're going to get back up. Revelation 12, 9 says this great dragon uh, in there talks about it. He's a dragon. We can't let him beat us down, right? But let me share with you here in Acts 28, 1 through 6, very quickly. There's this whole story about how they get on this island in Malta and he's gathering firewood up there. The Bible says in verse 3 of 28, it says, When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them in the fire, a serpent came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man's a murderer, though he has escaped from the sea. Justice has not allowed him to live. He, however, shook off the creature in the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up and fall over dead. But when they waited a long time and saw nothing happen to him, they changed their mind and said, he must be a God. Folks, I like that because faith is trusting God when the serpents are attacking. The serpents are the unseen forces in this world. Revelation, I just mentioned a moment ago, he's a dragon, he's a serpent in Revelation 12, 9. And John 8, 4 tells us, you're children of your father, the devil, and, and you love to do the evil he does. He was a murderer from the beginning, and there's no truth in him. He's a liar. You see, our enemy is always trying to come against us with lies, trying to get us to believe lies, and it's a constant attack, lies. And the reason is he wants to murder you. You mean like kill us dead? Oh, that would be an extra bonus. But I'm just about stop you from living. You see, some of you said, well, you know, I've been alive now, and I'm 40 years old. I've been alive now and I'm 50. I've been alive and 60. That's a lie. You've just existed for so many lives. To live is to live in Jesus Christ and the power of his glory and know that he makes no mistakes. There's no mistakes in God. He is not. He didn't go, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Trust him with your life. Live. Refuse to let the devil knock you out. Refuse this enemy who steals from you. How do I do that? Well, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power, Ephesians uh, 6 tells us. Put on all the armor of God and stand your ground firm. Notice, stand. He didn't even say you had to keep marching. Sometimes all you can do is just stand. I'm going to stand still because he's beating on me and biting on me and trying his best to destroy me. But he says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against the unseen forces out there. So put on God's armies that we can resist the devil. Resist the enemy. And after we have resisted him, we'll be standing firm, he said. So put on the belt of truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Put on the shoes uh, of the peace that comes from the good news so that we'll be prepared. He can't knock us off if we're standing on the gospel. We're standing on Jesus. He's a solid rock. We hold up a shield of faith and say, we're going to stop those fiery darts. Fiery. Because they're like stingers of a scorpion. They hit you and they sting. That's what his lies do. And we put salvation on our helmet. I am a child of God. And we hold the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. We yield it. Jesus always answered the devil, with scripture you see we win some of you right now you've had major interruptions in your life and the enemy is biting you and you're going down some of you are going down you're looking for a miracle cure let me tell you there's only one cure and his name is Jesus and it's his blood it's his blood one last thing in verse 8 and 10 you're looking at passage, it says that it happened that the father there of Publius, 
lay sick with fever and dysentery. Anybody been on a mission trip can identify that, right? Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, he healed him. He healed him. And then he healed all on that island with diseases. Faith is trusting God no matter what's happening in your life and ministering to the needs of others. The Bible says over and over, stop looking at yourself and start looking at others. Stop trying to see how's this benefit me? What's this about me? I want you to minister to me. No, minister to others in the name of Jesus. Even in the midst of all that he had gone through, even now, still on an island here, and he wasn't sure exactly what the income, only that God had said, you're going to Rome. He knew that. He didn't know how long he was going to be there. In spite of that, by being bitten by a serpent, he ministers to the needs of, this peop of the people of that island. Folks, listen to me. You and I in Christ are not losers. We are not victims. The devil loves victims. We are winners in Jesus. We may have strong winds blowing against us, but we keep right on putting one foot in front of the other. We might have hurricane destruction that seems to be bringing our lives down, but we don't cower down. We keep moving through because God in Christ will never let us go, never abandon us, never. Interruptions of life? Nah. We're going to keep right on taking of our, care of ourselves physically. We're going to take care of ourselves spiritually so that we might be of service to God and minister to others. Do you know Jesus first? You see, do you know him? You see, it takes an act of faith. It's not good works. There's no such thing as I'm going to do good things and get into heaven. No, you'll do good things if you're going to heaven in Christ, but it's Jesus. And it takes faith to put your whole life into Jesus. But I promise you, he'll never let you down. He'll forgive you of every sin, every failure. He'll give you strength when you don't know if you can keep going on. He'll keep getting you up and getting you up and getting you up and getting you up and you'll keep walking and you'll keep moving and you'll keep going. You might get knocked down. You'll not be knocked out, remember? Knocked down but not knocked out. Why? Because Jesus is in me and greater is he than what? The world. He's the one who created it all. So if you don't know Jesus, come to know him today. Turn away from the good things you think is going to get you in heaven. Turn away from the sins and the failures that you think keep you out and trust Jesus Christ in him alone and ask him to save you today, and he will. For those of you that are believers, you probably are in one of these categories. Maybe you've got strong winds against you. Maybe you've got the hurricanes. Maybe you're in the midst of, uh, of major interruptions. I mean, it's there. You know where you are. Are you in the dark? Have you given up all hope? Are you throwing things out of your life? You're throwing them out now. God, I've got to dump and run. Well, I hope if that's you, you've run to the right place because I'm telling you, Jesus says, the dump stops here. We're going to go on. And I'll show you how you can turn a garbage can into a table and a feast. The reality is, as God majors in transformations, if you'll trust him this morning with your physical life, with your spiritual life, if you will, will stop dwelling on what's wrong and stop dwelling on what's right, if you'll stop dwelling on what you've lost and dwell on what you're blessed with, I'm telling you, it is the victory. Minister to others. Minister to others. Would you stand with me as we pray? <clears throat> Father God, in Jesus' name, <clears throat> I am so thankful that the word that you give us is true. Oh, Father, how I thank you that we are not alone, that you will never leave us, you'll never abandon us, that our life it, it isn't going to end useless. And so I'm praying, God, that you speak to us as only you can speak. I don't know how you want to speak to people. I know that you want those who have never trusted you as Savior, Lord. 
to be able to come to know you right now. And so I say to all of you, wherever you may be, trust Jesus with all your life. Stop counting on things in your past to keep you in, get you in heaven or keep you out of heaven and trust in Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Trust him right now and he will save you. And then let somebody know it. Let somebody know it. Tell them, man, I'm trusting Christ. And Father, you, you know who's watching. You know who's in this room. You know all the darkness in our lives. You know the winds, whether they're gentle and breezy right now or whether they're strong or whether they're hurricanes. You, you know whether our house seems to be falling down. You know whether we're so in the dark we can't see any hope. We can't see any way out. You, you know where we are because you love us. And, and, and we've trusted in you, but we've lost our way. That's what darkness does. I'm praying, God, open up our eyes. Be strength in our legs. Be a heart of courage, a clear mind, ears to hear your voice, and help us get back up. Help us begin to move forward no matter how strong the winds. Knowing you are not somewhere we're not, you're with us in the storm and so God I'm praying in Christ's name help us see our weakness and our need to be dependent upon you in whatever we're going because none of us can do this on our own we can't even do it with just one another we need you above all else to really make it forgive us of how we've lived oh God and help us make commitments new and fresh to you today I give you great glory for who you are I thank you for every decision made. May it give you glory, God, and honor. I ask you to go with us. Help us to go in your power and your strength. And I pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen and amen. I love you, folks. God bless you. I hope you have a great Sunday.